my name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Maedin Television. One of you. I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kale Mahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but discussing Europe and the big freeze. Just a few days ago, it looked as if the people of the biggest economies in Europe were facing a cataclysmic big freeze. They were facing gas and electricity bills that were literally unpayable, and a big movement was building, in Britain at least, on the basis of can't pay, won't pay, and enough is enough. Now, I've been through campaigns like that. Mrs. Thatcher introduced a poll tax, which was piddling compared to the energy price rises that were in the pipeline, if you'll forgive the pun, and it brought her government down. And so the governments of France and Britain and Germany have had to look lively to see off what could have been a disaster with gas and electricity consuming half of the old age pension lived on by millions of people in Britain. Poor people, the poorest people in the country, families on low incomes facing three quarters of their income by April being consumed in their gas and electricity bills. The British inflation rate is forecast by the officials in charge of it to be 22.6% by April of next year. These are levels of price increases that are unsustainable in a country where workers are routinely offered 3% wage increases. In other words, a 22% wage cut and excoriated as wreckers when they decide to go on strike for a wage increase that will at least have some resemblance to the level of price increases that they are suffering. However, the magic money tree in Germany and Britain, at least, has come to the rescue. You know, the one that politicians kept telling us didn't exist when we said that austerity was becoming unbearable and government needed to fork out some money to soften the punishment. Well, the magic money tree is back. No sooner had little soldier Schultz, the minority chancellor of Germany, offered a 65 billion euro economy package to head off the increase in energy price rises, the British Prime Minister of only a few days standing has let it be known, though the details are a little scant at the moment, that 130 billion pounds, remember a pound is more than a euro, though only for the moment, perhaps, and both are less than they were against the dollar, almost double the German subvention is to be paid out in Britain. However, it's not, it would appear, going to be given out to the people, which would be far more efficacious in terms of economic health. It's going to be given a subsidy to the already bloated private energy companies in Britain, some of whom are actually government-owned by other European governments, like France. You with me so far? It would cost about £50 billion to bring these energy companies back into public ownership and control, and then the government would set the price of energy. And if that sounds to you like an outlandish idea from Mars, you evidently don't know that only 30 years ago in Britain, all of these energy companies didn't exist and the country owned electricity, gas, as well as 
railways and posts and many other things. This is an aberration from the norm, this private ownership of public utilities that are vital, essential to the life of the people. So where this 130 billion in Britain or the 65 billion in Germany is going to come from is an economic question of great importance. It seems to me that with inflation set to be 25% in the spring, this can only put a spring in inflation's step. Now, I'm just the enthusiastic amateur. I'm joined, as always, by a panel of distinguished experts. First up of whom is Shabir Razbi, a distinguished economist and equally distinguished broadcaster and a regular guest here on Kalima Hora. Shabir, where is it going to come from? Thank you very much, George. Look, at the end of the day, the whole austerity measures that you referred to, which came into existence after the financial crisis of 2008. And what I like to refer to uh, as an economist, you know, there's a concept of trickle-down effect, which is not really trickle-down, it's what I call voodoo economics. It's really something that uh, economists have been sort of portraying for the last 40 years, when Reagan came into power in USA, and also Margaret Thatcher and the whole sort of ethos of the contract between the public and the government was dismantled, the welfare state uh, was being, uh, if you like, uh, uh, cut off. Down. Yes, yeah. slowly and slowly and gradually. And then the whole privatization. That again is voodoo-lomics, you know, privatize the things. And then the whole concept is so extraordinary from a purely economic perspective is we are told that if you privatize companies, they become more efficient, uh, they can deliver better. How ridiculous is that? If there's a profit margin, then the cost will go up automatically from a very simple economic perspective. Uh, if someone is going to cost uh, 100 pounds and there's a profit margin on, of 10 pounds, let's say, on it, then the consumer will pay simply 110 pounds for it. So the whole concept of trickle down, uh, privatization, uh, sort of selling the silver, as it was known in Margaret Thatcher's period, that we were selling all these important industries, like you referred to, uh, gas, electricity, posts, railways, you name it. Whatever was available was sold, went into the private hands, and at the same time, the chief executives of those big enterprises were raking three, four million pounds a year, plus bonuses. On top of that, the ordinary employees were getting paid 25, 30, 40,000 pounds, whatever. And then again, we are sold the concept that, you know, if you reduce taxes, uh, then, you know, the economy doesn't grow. But the reality is that it's sold to the ordinary public as though. Uh, having higher taxes, they will get less salaries. The whole concept that is being debated now is that it's going to cost 130 million or whatever you said, uh, uh, the energy package, uh, and it's still going to cost only 50 million to bring them into private, uh, into public uh, uh, space. I, you know, the logic is there, but really because we have a conservative government in power, and dare I say even the Labour government, uh, under Steimer. Yeah, yeah. They <laughs> offer far less. Than exactly, the exactly. Government. So the reality is that the economic model has failed, has been shown to be in the favour of the wealthy 1% or let's say 5% of the population, the 95% have always got to pay, uh, 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 you know, the cost of mismanagement, uh, of greed, of all kinds of evils that come out of having an economy which is based purely on profit rather than having some concept of that certain aspect of the economy should be in the, for the benefit of the mass of the public. And that's where I think the big problem lies, not sort of how much it's going to cost and so on, but who's going to pay for it. As we saw during 2008, the banks were rescued, uh, you know, too big to fail sort of concept. Similarly, that's what's being touted, what's being the, the, touted the, 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 energy, the energy sector, mm. you know, the money is going to go to the coffers of the energy 
companies. And who's going to take the benefit? The shareholders will get their uh, uh, sort of dividends. The chief executives and the other top management will rake the money out. And at the end of the day, we'll have to pay for it on a continuous basis. Of course. So there's something utterly, utterly wrong about the whole economic model that is being sort of practised. Dr. Niall McRae, you're a former lecturer at uh, King's College uh, in London, but you're now an official of uh, the Workers of England Trade Union. Maybe you've got two hats in this debate. Tell me. Well, I, I, I think that uh, the likes of you on the left, George, you've tended to be more alert than people from the more conservative side like me to the, the malevolence of, of governments. And I think that we, on the conservative side, are, are sort of waking up to that now over the last two or three years. Um, it, it, the, the startling realisation is that the British government and other Western governments want us to suffer. They, the, 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 it's not just collateral damage of net zero. Uh, impoverishment is the purpose. Mm -hmm. They want elderly to freeze in their homes this winter. They want driving to be unaffordable. They want families to struggle to put food on the table. This is a great reset in action. And it's about getting total control of resources. And what the, is going on in Ukraine, straight away I could see that this is, obviously there's a historic problem there between tension between Russia and Ukraine, but the real purpose of this war in Ukraine, because it was provoked by the West, provoked by NATO, provoked by the US deep state, and the EU placed sanctions on Russian gas and oil. Um, the public are being led to believe that this is Putin that did this. No, it was the EU that did this. The EU has been doing this to its own citizens. And this is the Great Reset. This is what net zero I I is doing. And, and, and I think that um, what's going to happen um, this winter is going to be... Uh, uh, if, if the establishment manages to keep control of this because they want a crisis, this is the mechanism of problem, reaction, solution. And we saw what happened in Sri Lanka, mm. where the, uh, the, the, the riots were occurring. That was a reaction to the petrol shortages. And the solution was petrol rationing on a digital system, QR codes. And that's ex exactly what I think the authorities want to do with the um, contrived energy crisis in Britain and the West. It's problem, reaction, solution. And they hope that they're going to keep in control of the reaction because there is going to be unrest. There's going to be the Don't Pay UK campaign you mentioned, George. But they think that they'll be able to control it and they'll be able to use the reaction to bring in um, the tighter controls of energy um, and, and pursue the net zero to its um, conclusion. Wow. That's powerful uh, stuff. Clive Mezes is a researcher and analyst of political economy. He writes at outersight.org. Clive, and welcome back uh, to the show. That's quite apocalyptic, uh, what Dr. Nile said, that this is actually intended to cause the pain that it plainly will. Do you agree? Uh, I agree, although I don't necessarily subscribe to the view that governments are actually orchestrating this off their own volition. This is, this is money power in action. And Shabir referred to the 2008 global financial crisis, the bailout of the banks. That was the seeds of hyperinflation, which is where this all started. The green agenda, as Neil has suggested, it is actually exacerbating the problem. There was a very good paper brought out by a chap called Mark Mills in 2019, which talks about the inconvenient energy realities, that this idea that we can transition from a hydrocarbon economy into a green economy is just cloud cuckoo land. It has no foundation in yeah. reality. Uh, and net zero, Let's remember, we're all carbon life forms. All life is carbon. Mm -hmm. What does net zero tell you? It tells you there is no room for people or life on Earth. They're looking to 
uh, if you like, reduce We are the carbon. We are the carbon that they're looking <laughs> to reduce. So if you look at the... If we look at the triggers for this, because this has been long in the post, hyperinflation has been predicted by so many people for so long, uh, and it is now here. These are the chickens that, that quantitative easing and all the bank bailouts, these chickens are coming home to roost. And the trigger was the so-called war that Russia has invaded Ukraine. The reality was that NATO was pushing, 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 and Ukraine is the victim in this. It's a patsy. It's being used. The people are suffering because NATO wants to debilitate Russia. And this has a long history. But if you look at the sanctions that were imposed, it was, it was apparent to everyone who wasn't subscribing to the virtue signalling authorised narrative that this was shooting ourselves in the foot. It was precipitate precipitated by America. Europe was bullied into climbing on board. It's, it's complete suicide in energy terms. The, I, the percentages I don't have, but we get from Russia, or we had been getting, the world had been getting potash, urea, corn, barley, wheat, all of these food Fertilizers. Well, that, that's precious, urea yeah, and potash. Everything, yeah. So we're getting that. We've stopped them having Gucci handbags and Mercedes. They don't need those to live. We need energy and we need food. And that is what we are being deprived of <coughs> through these recessions. So it was deliberate. There's a, there's a really, if you, if you want to pick this apart, there's a really good commentary on March the 9th, uh, March the 9th this year by Gonzalo Lira, who comments from the Ukraine. And he broke this down very effectively, that this was going to result in what we're seeing today. Um, and this has a much longer history, which maybe we'll come back to, and I'll, I'll leave it there. But yeah. the whole point is, this is orchestrated not by governments, this is driven by the money system, which drove the financial crisis and everything that's happened since. Dr Greg Simons is in Poland, uh, just for a conference on uh, Europe's challenges ahead. Uh, he is an expert in international relations, geopolitics, and crucially, Propaganda. He's associate professor at the IRES at Uppsala University and a lecturer in the Department of Communications in Riga in Latvia. Dr. Simons, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Dr. Greg, how cold is the coming winter in Europe likely to be? Well, it's one uh, which the EU has a significant input in. I mean, the policies that they've been pursuing uh, in the name of the US's geostrategic interests uh, are going to put European uh, lives and businesses at risk. And uh, th this has been blamed, of course, on Russia, uh, with the Europeans being blameless. I mean, it was just, yeah, I think, that uh, von der Leyen, uh, used the notorious um, slogan that she wanted to flatten the curve on uh, electricity consumption. I suspect this will go about the same way as the EU's coronavirus strategy. With a winter of unaffordable energy bills, with blackouts, power cuts, and the resultant unemployment and cessation of economic activity that will go with it, how bad is it going to get in Europe? Well, it's critical because the point is that the European economies are not strong. The, the European economies are already weak uh, because of a general financial mismanagement plus the effects of the coronavirus strategies. And now we're going into yet another crisis, which is uh, largely self-made. And th this is just going to further weaken things. It's also going to further weaken people's trust in uh, government. I mean, we, we can already see, I mean, these idiotic remarks from different politicians who should know better. The German um, econom economic minister um, said that, well, their businesses might close, etc., uh, etc., cetera, et cetera but you know that they're not going to go bankrupt but they will not reopen 
uh, and they do not seem to care about the average person and the small businesses, small medium businesses. And yeah, I mean, this this is going to be people uh, who can least afford it that are bearing the costs again, while they, the EU and so forth talk about solidarity and all of these very commonly used slogans. But everyone is not in the same boat, and this will bear out as we go. I mean, the, the winter uh, is going to be a hard one, uh, but not everyone is going to suffer equally. I mean, I see Switzerland now, uh, this is outside the EU, uh, if someone heats their home beyond 19 degrees Celsius, they can spend three years in jail. I mean, <laughs> democracy, yes, uh, it's certainly going interesting directions. How bad are the European public going to suffer from the shortage of energy? Well, I think we're already starting to see some hints about how this is going to be handled. Because keep in mind that people have just come off two years of this coronavirus hysteria where their, uh, their rights and so forth have been completely, utterly run over. And now we're going into the next crisis where they're preparing to run over uh, the same thing again, plus their uh, econo economic survivability. And you can see in Germany, I mean, even the German people who are normally quite, um, well, disciplined and quite orderly are starting to make a fuss about this. I mean, Italian citizens are burning their power bills. So I, I suspect there'll be large manifestation. This is, this is why you've had the, this very quiet introduction by these governments, these so-called democratic governments that are saying, well, they're going to have extra police. They're going already. So you, you can already see what's coming up this winter. Uh, it's going to be another repression of basic civil liberties and human rights. And they're going to continue calling it a democracy and people at the bottom are going to continue to suffer. But I think the patience is wearing thin. I mean, we can see in Holland, the Netherlands, I mean, when the, the, those uh, farmers were confronted with violence, uh, it escalated. And I think even if the governments think they can suppress uh, civilians' rights, uh, and also, I mean, these are reasonable rights which they're trying to uh, preserve, uh, that there will be increased pushback against governments. And yeah, I mean, th this is what you're seeing now, and this is even before the winter, this is before it gets cold. When it gets cold, of course, this will escalate. Did the Western leaders not know the consequences of their own actions launching economic warfare against Russia? Are they fools or are they knaves? Which? I think it's a combination of two things. Uh, So-called leaders of uh, liberal democracies in Europe are seemingly getting increasingly stupid and at less <laughs> capable intellectually uh, to manage basic things. I mean, we've seen, we're, everyone's been complaining about Boris Johnson. Uh, just wait for a few months of Liz Truss and, and you, you people will be wanting back to Boris Johnson. So th this is one thing, this, this quality of leadership. Uh, but the other thing, there is no independence and in political will of the Europeans to defend their own interests. They're doing US bidding. This, this is a US economic war on Russia to weaken and contain Russia. And the US, I mean, countries like Germany have gone from being a vassal state uh, to a client state, because you've seen Merkel go and Schultz come in, uh, and basically they've, they've had any resistance to US diktats uh, crushed by the US. So I think that's another problem. They adhere to US strategic imperatives, <clears throat> which contradict European interests. Well, I was in a very fancy restaurant in a fancy part of London just this very day at someone else's expense, I should add. 
and they were partying there like it's 1999 in the words of Prince, not Prince Charles, the Prince. I'll be back right after this. Stay tuned. You're watching Kalamahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming from London, discussing Europe and the big freeze that is on its way this winter. Dr. Nile, I listened very carefully to what you said, as I always do. Um, the overwhelming question that was screaming between my ears was, why? We live in a capitalist society. Capitalism requires the people to be able to buy things. If they cannot buy things, no one can make a profit from it. So as you described, a deliberate policy of beggaring uh, the wealthy countries, I ask myself, why? So why? Uh, well, it's a good question. I'm not sure I've got uh, 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 the absolute right answer to that, George. But I, I think that what's happening is we are now um, moving very steadily towards a technocracy. And this is the application of technology to take total control of population and resources. I mean, this was a dream back from back in the 1920s and 1930s, but they didn't have the technological means then. Um, th th they do now. There's a very strong um, eugenics aspect to some of what you hear from the, the, the globalists. They're, they're, they're using terms like useless eaters quite openly. And, and, I, and I do believe that there are... Uh, I, I, I think Clive is absolutely right. I wasn't suggesting that it's, it's individual governments all making their own independent decisions. I think there are global forces here, very strong global forces. You saw that with COVID, and you see it with climate change, with net zero. And you see it with the expansion of NATO as well in, in this uh, Ukraine situation. So I think governments are being told um, what to do. And, and I believe that, that, that this is very much modelled on the combination of um, uh, communism and rapacious capitalism that you have I I in China. Um, and, and I believe that that model is being gradually well, quite, quite quickly now, being rolled out across the world, the idea that we're going to have lockdowns at the drop of a hat. You know, The Guardian is now boasting we need to have climate lockdowns at least every two years, boasting about this. So you can see that things like democracy and freedom of speech and uh, basic human rights, these things are all being abandoned now. It's a, it, it's, the globalists are really rushing now. They think this is their opportunity to make this great reset happen. And I believe unless people wake up en masse in time, and there are people waking up, but not quickly enough, I think there are protests, as we've heard in places like Germany, but there needs to be much more active resistance against this because otherwise the future is very bleak. Well, it's an ill wind, of course, that blows nobody any good. And my next guest has done really well out of the Cold War. I sat with him in Parliament for decades. He was the Conservative MP for a Devon constituency. Nowadays, he lives off the moral earnings of a writer of spy novels. He is the one and only Nigel West. Nigel, welcome on the show. Okay. Nigel, uh, European governments, including our own, uh, are now scrambling to respond to energy shortages, which are fueling phenomenal rates of inflation and may actually bring all the Western European economies tumbling down. How did we get to that situation? We got to this point through a tragic miscalculation by Vladimir Putin. He clearly thought and his advisors were not going to contradict him, that he would occupy Kiev within three days. Uh, now, six months later, he's desperate 
he's on the run and he is doing what he's entitled to do is to weaponize his, his gas exports. And this gives him great leverage, particularly in those countries like Germany that have hugely increased their reliance on the consumption of Russian gas. And as a consequence of that, he has declared economic warfare, uh, not just on his neighboring countries, but on his own customers. And this is going to be a game changer in, in every respect. But in intelligence terms, it means that we are on a war footing and the government is intervening in the gas price market in order to compensate people who would otherwise be victimized by Putin. Let's talk about Germany. Uh, little soldier Schultz, the German chancellor who has no majority uh, in the Reichstag, is about to spend 65 billion euros on intervening in the energy market. Where's that money going to come from? I don't think that that matters. Uh, this is a war scenario. Uh, this is an unprecedented situation. If you go back in British military history, even to Suez, we were not in these circumstances where the Russian government has effectively weaponized its principal energy export and is gambling that the West will suffer Ukraine warfare fatigue and that over the coming months, the support for the Kiev Zelensky uh, administration will fade away. And the only way to deal with that is to your hand into the Treasury. And that is exactly what has happened and is the only response in a war scenario. Won't the people of Europe begin to get upset, uh, like the farmers in the Netherlands, like the demonstrators in uh, Germany, like the yellow vests throughout a whole year uh, protesting against austerity and other things? What happens if millions of Europeans pour onto the streets against their governments? Well, that, that may well be the case. And, of course, Vladimir Putin is gambling on a, a cold winter and discontent amongst European populations who will then put pressure on their governments to put pressure on Zelensky to reach an accommodation with Putin. The alternative to that is that Europe stays firm compensates its citizens, uses its ingenuity to circumvent this, what amounts to an economic attack. And bear in mind what is being played for here. It's not short-term boundaries of the Ukrainian government. This is the future of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Uh, it's the future of Sweden and Finland. Do you imagine for one moment that if pressure was applied to Zelensky and he was forced in some way to make an accommodation with Putin, that next year Putin will uh, decide that he will invade another neighbor. And just bear in mind that all of these decisions made in the Kremlin date back to the Bagram airfield surrender when American troops vanished overnight from Bagram airfield, it's quite clear that the Putin uh, regime decided that Americans couldn't be trusted and that they would not fight for an ally that they'd made a commitment to. And that's where we are now. If you acquiesce and uh, if you accommodate a dictator who is hell-bent on hegemony, then you take the consequences. And we've seen that, what happens when that occurs in history. You think the European public can cope with the crisis to come? Well, we'll have to wait and see whose who's gamble works out. Putin has gambled that applying pressure, weaponizing the energy market will be to his advantage. Uh, the other countries who are now his victims 
They can either surrender to that pressure or they can resist. And we know what happens if you fail to resist. Come on, Nigel. We sat together in Parliament for almost 30 years. I'm asking for your prediction on what is likely to happen. You were the oracle in Parliament, after all. And I think there is a difference between the countries that are closest to Russia, uh, the former countries of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, the countries of Central Europe, and the United Kingdom. So we are quite separated because we've never had to, not for hundreds of years, have we had to endure invasion and occupation. Central Europe are prepared to experience those kinds of privations that you've described, precisely because they've undergone that experience in the past. And if you want my prediction, I think that Vladimir Putin will be gone within a relatively short space of time. Um, I've been wrong so far. He's survived six months of this war. I very much doubt he'll survive another six months. And within half an hour of him leaving the political scene, there will be a dramatic change in the gas price. There will be a resupply from Russia. And there will be reset in our economic and political relations with the Kremlin. Thank God he's now a novelist and no longer a politician. <laughs> uh, we could spend a day and a half uh, unpicking that, but one phrase that Nigel West used, we'll have to put our hands in the Treasury. But the Treasury is us. The Treasury is the taxpayer. And the Treasury is already dry after the expenditure of hundreds of billions during the COVID crisis. So we live in a country where, where 39 billion was spent on a track and trace scheme of which there is neither track nor trace. How many more billions have we got in this treasury? Well, George, I think, <clears throat> I think that was a complete inversion of reality that we've just heard. Unbelievable. Alice in Wonderland, actually. Exactly. Um, but it's a trick that has been played a long time. But I'll answer your question first, because I, th I think that is very much key to what we're talking about. We're heading for hyperinflation and economic collapse, such as never been seen by generations alive today. It may even eclipse the 1930s. There are things that we can do to mitigate that, but I don't think we need to go into that at the moment. But the existing system is no longer viable. It is no longer fit for purpose. It was, you always require a reset of debt. And the reason that <clears throat> so much debt is produced, student loans, debt for pharmaceuticals, debt for bailouts, debt for wars, they're all used to create this money supply because once you stop creating the money supply, the whole thing collapses. Uh, and we're in a position the position of Weimar Germany in the 1920s, the position of France in 1720, the position of many countries that have suffered hyperinflation. You, you keep issuing currency, and the man said, Nigel said, we'll have to dip into the treasury. That means creating yet more and more money. So we're heading for hyperinflation. And you asked the question of Neil, why is this happening? And this has nothing to do with ideology, conservative or socialist. Uh, both are played. They are both used as weapons. And this, this ideology of destruction, which is effectively what it is, has a two and a half thousand year history. And without going back through the whole amount, two world wars were fought in 20th century to destroy European nation states. This is an extension of that process. It is a natural progression because the ultimate aim is total dom domination of most of us who will be regarded as sub a subspecies by the relative few who control the levers of power. It's as simple as that. This is not a conspiracy theory because all of the conspiracy theories that lead you to that conclusion are now being shown as conspiracy fact. 
real conspiracies. And that's what we're in the middle of. And this war, this idea that Putin wants to annex the rest of Europe, this was an existential move by Vladimir Putin and the Russians. And he didn't do it on his own. And this is not a single character. Well, within this half an hour, if he has a heart attack, uh, Yeltsin will be back, according to uh, Nigel. Uh, Shabir, I I'm only an A-level economist. But even I know that excessive oversupply of money equals uncontrollable inflation. Now, I'm not talking inflation of 22 to 25 percent currently predicted. I'm talking of inflation of Weimar uh, proportions. How is that in anybody's interest? Uh, I, I think you're being modest and humble as usual. Uh, you have more than A-level economics, I think. You know? Formally, I only have an A-level. <laughs> It was an A pass, but look, it was only an A level. Look, uh, George, you've been a politician in Parliament. Uh, th the reality is that half of the members of Parliament, the ministers, uh, they went to Oxford and Cambridge, all these illustrious universities. What did they study? PPP, politics, philosophy and economics. Uh, So-called intelligent, the elite, the sort of creme de la creme, of the nation are supposed to be in parliament and uh, the ministers. And of course, the professors, no sort of uh, <laughs> comment on you, professor, but the professors who've been teaching economics for the last 40 years perhaps are not teaching economics with a human face, if you like. It's econometrics which is being taught, just numbers game, making models, but not really considering uh, the human factor that comes into it. It's very nice to have, you know, um, all kinds of excellent models that they teach at London East, uh, School of Economics. But the reality is that that doesn't work in the real uh, sort of uh, uh, world. People don't have a calculator just calculating things. People do things altruistically. People do charitable work without actually saying how much profit I'm going to make or how much less I'm going to pay, pay on certain things. These are factors that, um, you know, one doesn't consider when economists start uh, talking about economics. And, you know, it's really interesting that, you know, it's not only inflation which is going to be a problem, to answer your question, it's what is going to come, stagflation, another sort of economic term which economists often define use. It, define yeah. it. Stagflation, you have a stagnation, meaning there's no growth in the economy, and at the same time you have high inflation. Therefore, um, in simplistic terms, if there is growth, then that can sort of accommodate the inflation that may be in the economy. But when the economy is not growing and you have inflation, you really have a double whammy, if you like. It creates a huge problem and the economy doesn't grow and people have to pay more money for, you know, like wages not going up, productivity being low and so on. But the reality is that, you know, we can blame it on Putin. We can, you know, we as a nation... Uh, for the last 200 odd years, we have weaponized everything, if you like. We have weaponized uh, sanctions. We are talking about not just uh, Russian oil not coming on the market, Venezuelan oil not coming on the market due to uh, 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 sanctions, Iranian oil not coming on the market due to sanctions. I think Mr. Orban, the uh, uh, Hungarian president, quite rightly said, Clive, not just that we have shot ourselves in the foot, but he said we've shot ourselves in the lungs. Mm. <laughs> you know? That's <a> powerful. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's a very imagine. poignant comment, if you like, yeah. that this is what Europe has done. And just on Nigel's comment, I remember 40 years ago when your friend uh, uh, David Owen, I think, was the foreign secretary and the revolution in Iran happened. And I remember vividly him coming on BBC saying that this revolution is going to finish in two weeks. And 42 years later, the revolution is still there. So I think, uh, you know, 40... Their predictions are not worth much. Uh, Absolutely. Shabir, I was present that night in a hall addressed by Dr David Owen, the then Labour Foreign Secretary, in 1979. Mm, I remember. Uh, he made that prediction to us in the hall before he went on the BBC really? to do it. Uh, Dr. Owen, though still alive, is no longer <laughs> consulted much about 
political history. Dr. Nile, uh, lastly from you. Um, you and I are both opponents of the European Union. You with the Bruges group, I'm with the Tony Benn, uh, Michael Foote School mm. of uh, Hostility to the European Union. Mm. But nonetheless, are you surprised at how the European leaders, both of the Union and the individual European leaders, have been so ready to jump over the cliff for Joe Biden and the Democrats in Washington? Because I am actually surprised at it. Well, isn't that an assumption that it's about Joe Biden and the current Democrat administration, I think it runs deeper than that. And it also runs a lot broader than that as well. There, there is clearly some very powerful global forces at work. And we saw it with COVID and we see it with climate change. Um, obviously, money is there in the background as a, well, in the foreground, perhaps we should say, uh, as, a, as a very sort of governing um, factor here. Um, it's, it's quite startling, isn't it, that the European Union, that some of its like most fundamental uh, tenets, like freedom of movement, that was ab abandoned with, um, uh, with, with, with COVID. And all of these human rights, look what they've done to Russian people. Mm. You know, not, not just uh, Kremlin um, administrators, oh, all Russian people are now being treated like Hitler treated the Jews. So that is where the EU is taking us. And, you know, I, I, I've campaigned a lot against the um, COVID tyranny. And there was going to be uh, a rejoin the EU rally, and it was cancelled. And we were going to go with a banner saying, EU equals mandatory injections. Is that your ode to joy? Hmm. The people who are marching in favour of the EU are supporting these sanctions which are killing people. Mm. People are going to die as a result of these energy net zero sanctions, which has got nothing really to do with Putin. Putin is just a cover story for this. The whole Ukraine thing was set up as a cover story for this um, misanthropic curtailment of human existence. Well, there we have it. It's either going to be a long, cold, bitter winter in the European Union and in the United Kingdom, no longer in the European Union, or it's going to be a long, hot, bitter winter with yellow vests on the streets and this time not just in France. Time will tell, but the basic facts are these. The only way out of the energy-driven economic collapse of Western European countries is the bankrupting of those very same Western European countries through the expenditure of hundreds of billions of euros and pounds in order to keep the lights on and the fires on. And that's only the rich countries of Europe. What are the poorer countries of Europe going to do? For them, the game is now just beginning. If I could see into the future, I don't think there's any period that I would like to see more clearly than the period we are about to enter into. Notwithstanding the fantasies of the fiction writer Nigel West that you have seen on this show, the people who have gambled are the people who rule us in Western countries. The question is, will their gamble succeed? I've been George Galloway. You've been a marvellous audience for Kali Mahora on Al Maidin Television. Thank you for watching.